Hello. Welcome to Radio Free Gastonia, the internet's number one choice for emergency history content. This is part two of our episode about uh, American life, culture, and politics in the 1970s. In the first uh, episode, we sort of addressed a lot of the really traumatic uh, events of the late 1960s and political crises and conflicts um, that changed American life and made people very unsettled. Uh, the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and RFK in 1968, for instance. Uh, the continued unrest in American cities generated by you know, mounting frustration and anger and increasing hopelessness among America's urban residents, as exemplified in the film Pro-Daigo Myth, which we've watched. There were conflicts over desegregation in schools, uh, busing, the Vietnam War, and so forth. There was a mounting sense that we could not trust institutions, in large part because of the lies that the American people were told by Presidents Johnson and Nixon about the Vietnam War. And, of course, the Watergate scandal with President Nixon. So there was a deepening sense of cynicism and of something being astray and amiss um, in terms of the economy, in terms of politics, in terms of culture. So today's episode... It's called The Wheels Have Stopped. We'll get to why that is <clears throat> in a moment. But we have to start again, of course, with Watergate. Um, as we covered in the last episode, President Nixon did resign in 1974 because uh, it was pretty clear that he was going to be impeached and convicted. About the cover-up of the Watergate burglary, and sort of the broader conspiracy surrounding that and the culture of corruption around Nixon's 1972 campaign and his administration. If you're interested in the subject uh, a lot more, there's the wonderful book by Woodward and Bernstein called All the President's Men. They were the journalists who investigated the Watergate story and really broke it. And also the film based on the book with um, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, both very good. In any case, when Nixon resigned, he was replaced by his vice president, Gerald Ford. Now, Gerald Ford is one of these other kind of interesting characters in American history in the sense that he was not very interesting. Um, he seemed like a fundamentally, you know, nice guy. Um, <clears throat> he was never elected to be vice president or president. Um, he, you know, didn't get there on his charisma, let's just say. He actually became vice president to President Nixon when Nixon's first vice president, Spiro Agnew, um, had to resign after being convicted for tax evasion. And in this situation, the president was able to uh, pick the person to fill in for Agnew. He picked Gerald Ford, who was a congressional leader in the House uh, for the Republicans. So Ford finds himself in the situation where he's president all of a sudden, um, without ever having been on the ticket or uh, elected to the office. And there's this open, um, you know, wound, in a way, of Watergate in American life. He makes the choice to pardon President Nixon, uh, former President Nixon, with the idea that it's going to put all this to rest, rather than have, you know, <clears throat> further trials and, you know, drama around it to prolong this, you know, very, you know, sort of dark and seedy chapter of our nation's history. Ford just said, let's put it to rest. Unfortunately, or I don't know, unfortunately, um, many Americans thought that there was a corrupt bargain, that uh, Nixon had picked Ford to be vice president with the uh, understanding that he would pardon him or forgive him for whatever crimes he were committed. I don't know that there is actually evidence of that, but it contributed to this perception, contributed to a sense of corruption around the White House and produced the opposite effect of what Ford was hoping for. It actually um, sort of tarnished him with the uh, sort of uh, stink of Watergate. And it, it's fixed it in people's minds in a way he wanted it to go away, you know. So this is a mounting sense that the institutions aren't working. People have lost faith um, in the system. And this is where we get um, a young guy that I like to call Jimmy Carter. He had been the governor of Georgia, and he was a real dark horse for the presidential nomination of the Democrats in 1976. 
people really didn't know who he was. I mean, he was the governor of a pretty significant state, but um, in terms of the national political scene, he wasn't somebody that people thought was going to be the next president or even the next Democratic nominee. Um, this is one of the first times that the Iowa caucuses um, delivered kind of an upset for an insurgent campaign. Jimmy Carter seemed to come out of nowhere, and he was presenting himself as someone who would sort of help heal the nation. And this is a time of soul-searching for the country, and for whatever reason, Carter sort of intuited that. Um, at the time, he was really perceived as being a moderate or even you know, somewhat conservative Democrat when the Democratic Party had been moving pretty steadily to the left in the early 70s. So Carter seemed like a moderate choice. He was this governor of a southern state, the New South, right? And he managed to um, really surprise everyone by um, winning the Democratic nomination and running against President Ford and winning in 1976. <clears throat> Pretty close election, but um, Dem uh, Carter was the last um, Democrat to secure a popular vote uh, ma uh, majority, uh, that is to say more than 50%, uh, until Barack Obama in 2008. So there's a long period of time in between those two, uh, which is significant. So uh, Carter comes in and he's got this idea that, you know, I'm going to restore confidence in American institutions and government going to give a government as good as the American people. He was very um, openly pious, um, you know, Protestant, very, um, he, he, he made his moral um, religious convictions a big part of his appeal. Um, it might seem surprising today when maybe the, you know, U.S. Republican Party is associated more with um, Christianity or, or evangelical religion and the Democratic Party is sort of perceived as maybe being more secular. But um, at the time, Carter really uh, united a coalition of um, Southern moderates, evangelicals, and traditional Democratic voters um, throughout the country, the North, uh, the Midwest, and the South, to try to sort of make up for Watergate. I mean, it's very clear that was the subtext of Carter's campaign. But Carter's good intentions, um, as, be, as they may, um, were not really um, <laughs> borne out in office. Uh, he was, you know, somebody who brought a very sort of analytical, policy-oriented approach to governance without necessarily understanding um, the inner workings of, you know, what we call realpolitik, so to speak, um, in the government. He brought a lot of his own people from Georgia who were not political insiders, who didn't really know their way around Washington, and his agenda was really stymied uh, almost every turn. The thing you need to know above all about Carter is that he was trying to be a moderate uh, adjustment for the Democratic Party uh, to, you know, recognize the newly sort of more conservative temper of the country. And he was not very successful. Um, he gave a speech at one point, this was when we were still dealing with sort of energy problems and inflation, um, sort of recommending that people make some sacrifices. There was maybe an age of limits. Maybe we should turn you know, down the thermostat in our house to save energy, put on a sweater, don't keep your heater so high. Um, he was imploring the American people to give up something. And this was not a very popular message. Again, as we talked about in the previous episode, the whole premise of post-war American society was that uh, capitalism and liberal democracy would produce an ever-rising standard of living and you know, ever-growing prosperity for consumers. And the idea that we're going to you know, not grow or not get more things um, was not very appealing. He was pitching this as sort of shared sacrifice. And you know, this was not necessarily um, a message that was very well received. He also used the word malaise in this um, sort of famous speech. He was trying to talk about uh, a spiritual sense of loss in the country uh, and how we'd sort of lost our way and we needed to, you know, give up something for the greater good. Uh, but the word malaise was all that really stuck. And part of the reason for that is the economy was still bad and we had a lot of problems. For example, the Iran hostage crisis. This uh, is a very long story, but to make it short, uh, we, as we do, 
uh, helped overthrow the government of a democrat democratically elected leader in Iran in 1953 uh, because we were worried that uh, they would de democratize or nationalize the oil that is rightfully ours. And in the place of that leader was the Shah, who was a brutal authoritarian leader who ruled through terror and torture and so forth. There had been sort of a burbling, um, you know, social discontent and, and revolutionary spirit in the country for a while um, in the mid to late 1970s. This was a mix of, you know, sort of leftist impulses, uh, sort of theocratic, uh, revolutionary Islamic kind of leanings. So it wasn't all one thing. There were a lot of different activists and different, you know, factions of this Iranian uh, opposition that wanted to overthrow the Shah. And we had supported the Shah for, you know, over 20 years. So, you know, they didn't like us very much when they started to take over. There was a group of student radicals who took over the American embassy uh, in Tehran and took a bunch of hostages. This was um, a big black eye for the country um, after sort of the debacle of Vietnam, where we were seen to have uh, come up short, that our, you know, sense of martial superiority, that like, you know, we beat Hitler, we beat the Nazis, like we, we won every war. Um, and then Vietnam really, you know, saps our confidence in a certain way. And so does the Iran hostage crisis, because it's very clear that we're not able to do anything about it. Carter tries to organize a mission to go into Iran, and it is a big disaster. Remember to fill up on gas before you go on a major um, rescue mission. It does not go well, and it, sh it reinforces the sense of the ineffectiveness of government, the ineffectual quality of our leadership, and the um, weakening of our national power. It's, you know, like Vietnam, a situation in which we are um, sort of humiliated by a, a power that's supposed to be much weaker than us. And this makes Carter look bad, but it contributes to this ambient sense that the country economically, politically, militarily, in every, culturally, in every sense, is um, on the wrong track. So this is why I used the term imperfect storm in the previous uh, part of this episode, because it all came together. Vietnam, Watergate, the bad economy, foreign policy failures such as the Iran hostage crisis, um, Carter's rather feckless leadership, and also an emerging um, cultural movement that we now call the New Right, um, that's more of a political term, uh, or the Moral Majority, which is an organization that represented the uh, presence of evangelical Christ Protestant Christians in um, American political life. Um, prior to this point, to some extent, uh, major political, I mean, religious leaders had kind of stayed a little bit outside the fray of partisan politics, but in this time period you see Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, um, really organize a, a, a new constituency of very politically activated uh, evangelical Protestants, Baptists, and so forth, who really want to um, roll back things like uh, abortion after the Roe v. Wade uh, Supreme Court decision in 1973, uh, which legalized abortion, things like sex ed in schools, and the nascent uh, gay rights movement, which we talked about in terms of Stonewall before. So this is a, a new era. Um, part of that that is very interesting, I mean, there's a lot of historians written about it, but um, there's one scholar named Bethany Morton. She wrote this book called uh, To Serve God in Walmart, The Making of Christian Free Enterprise. Um, this is not just about the Christian right per se, but um, it's also about the change of American capitalism and the story of the history of Walmart and so forth, but it was a, a very interesting insight into um, this new political culture uh, attached to um, the sort of evangelical Protestant right. And one of the people that I would associate with that would be um, Phyllis Schlafly. Of course, Phyllis Schlafly was a communist, <laughs> I mean, sorry, oops, uh, a Catholic. Um, but she was part of this convergence of Christian conservatives in the 70s who really wanted to stop um, a lot of these social changes or roll back these social changes. And in particular, she was opposed to the Equal Rights Amendment, as you'll see in her piece, What's Wrong with Equal Rights for Women? 
Um, Shockley is a fascinating character. Um, she, you know, really emphasized that women should be home with the kids, uh, being supported by a husband, even though she was a career woman, uh, to put it mildly, and a very prominent public and political figure and writer in her own right. Um, so, you know, she would like to joke and say things like, uh, when she would give a speech like, um, I'd like to thank my husband for letting me be here tonight. Um, sort of acknowledging there's a little bit of a, a tension in her personal, you know, actual career and trajectory and what she was recommending, which is that it was actually good for women to have a subordinated status, that the Equal Rights Amendment was not good for women. Now, you'll remember that the Equal Rights Amendment had been around for a while. Back in the 1920s, um, Alice Paul of the National Women's Party had pushed very hard after women got the right to vote. It seemed like the next step, the next obvious step was an amendment to the Constitution saying that you couldn't discriminate against people on the basis of their sex or gender. Um, basically, if you can't treat people differently on the basis of being a man or a woman, that did not succeed in the 1920s. We know that Paul was a more militant uh, wing of the uh, women's movement at the time. But once second wave feminism started up in the 1960s, inspired by Betty Friedan, led by people like Gloria Steinem, the Equal Rights Amendment was one of the big goals. We want to pass an amendment to the Constitution that says you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And it came very close to passage. It was very close. Uh, the way it works, you know, it's a constitutional process where different states have to ratify it. It almost got to the right number, but Phyllis Schlafly and her allies, um, who were across the you know sort of Christian religious spectrum, did not think the ERA was good for women. Now you can look in the reading about um, the ERA by Phyllis Schlafly. She says that um, let's see, the American woman is the most privileged class to have ever lived. They have better technology, better standard of living more security, they've got a washing machine, and they've got a husband who will take care of them, they're able to raise their kids in beautiful suburbs. Um, this is the luckiest person that's ever lived. And you see um, that, as Schlafly says, this is accomplished by the institution of the family, our respect for the family as the basic unit of society, which is ingrained in the laws and customs of our Judeo-Christian civilization, is the greatest single achievement in the his entire history of women's rights. It assures a woman the most precious and important right of all. Note that, the most precious and important right of all. The right to keep her own baby and to be supported and protected in the enjoyment of watching her baby grow and develop. Now, of course, Schlafly is saying here that um, the most important thing for women is being mothers and that this is a sacred and paramount right to be nurtured and protected in the raising of your children. Um, she goes off into some, you know, more interesting uh, side paths in making this argument, saying that American culture in the 70s, or the post-war American culture, was paramount because we treasured the family as a unit and nurtured and lavished love and affection on women. Um, quote, Schlafly, in other civilizations, such as the African and the American Indian, the men strut around wearing feathers and beads and hunting and fishing, great sport for men. While the women do all the hard, tiresome drudgery, including the tilling of the soil, if any is done, the hewing of wood, the making of fires, the carrying of water, as well as the cooking, sewing, and caring for babies. This is not the American way because we were lucky enough to inherit the traditions of the age of chivalry. American women are suggesting that, you know, uh, this is saying that this is, we've, we've never had it so good. And she's advancing a very clear sense that it's actually men who are disadvantaged in the current setup in terms of alimony, in terms of child support um, uh, obligations and so forth, that they should protect their um, wives, the mothers of their children, and that the Equal Rights Amendment would actually uh, erase these special protections for women. That's her argument. She also does not like feminists, as you might guess. Um, she says, in the last couple of years, a noisy movement has sprung up agitating for, quote, women's rights. Suddenly, everywhere, we are afflicted with aggressive females on television talk shows yapping about how mistreated American women are, suggesting that marriage has put us in some kind of, quote, slavery, that housework is menial and degrading, and, perish the thought, 
that women are discriminated against. So she views the new second wave feminist women's liberation movement with a great deal of disdain, saying that they are, you know, making up problems where there aren't really any, and they're just unsatisfied, um, miserable, unmarried women who are, you know, also unattractive. Now, you might say this is a bit of an um, exaggerated caricature. I think it's fair to say that Schlafly was an early example of what, in today's culture, we would call a troll. She was definitely um, trying to get a rise out of feminists um, and liberals who supported the ERA by making the seemingly counterintuitive argument that actually being unequal was good for women. You can say that that's uh, sort of, you know, um, weird or silly or something, but the fact is they won, the ERA was not passed, and, you know, connected to that, this was an argument that won over a lot of Americans, that maybe the ERA isn't good, maybe feminism isn't good, it's maybe uh, against the family or traditional values. There are some older women who were homemakers and mothers as their primary occupation that might have felt threatened by um, the women's movement, not threatened, but insulted, that like my choices to be a mother and stay home with my children are being disrespected by people like Friedan and Steinem, who are saying that that's a, a prison, it's slavery. So there was at least enough political support to um, make Schlafly a very influential figure and to stop a an amendment to the Constitution that to this day has not been passed. So that's pretty significant, right? Um, this is part of a general format against uh, the social changes of the era. Um, there's also my good friend Anita Bryant, who was a, um, a you know pop singer, uh, a beauty pageant queen, uh, who sort of made her name in a way, or at least political hay, out of opposing uh, an anti-discrimination ordinance uh, in Miami, Florida, that would have uh, prevented discrimination against gays and lesbians. Um, this became a cause celeb for the religious right. This is one of the first efforts to really put into law a protection for LGBT people in America. This was a local city ordinance, but it became um, a symbol of this big change. Um, Anita Bryant campaigns to get this overturned. Uh, it's a whole political kerfuffle. Um, gay bars across the country start um, making um, uh, screwdrivers with uh, cranberry juice instead of orange juice because uh, Anita Bryant was a spokesperson for the citrus industry. Anyway, it was a whole thing. And there's a famous moment where Anita Bryant was uh, smacked in the face with a cream pie um, during one of her public appearances. And this is just part of a general sense of like, the reason why the economy is bad, the reason why our politics are screwed up, is that we've gotten more, the reason why we're militarily weaker is that we have been morally compromised. We've abandoned the ways of tradition and, you know, embarked on a social experiment uh, driven by radicals and feminists that, you know, is not good for our culture. We can see the evidence. That's the argument. They're like, look, look, look at the mess this country is in. It's because of the social and moral rot um, in the society. Now, one could say, okay, well, that seems a little bit much. But it's not just limited to um, people on the Christian right or Phyllis Schlafly, for that matter. Um, as I mentioned, Jimmy Carter was appealing to a sense that there was a moral um, drift in American society and that it needed to be a sense of citizenship and, and moral obligation needed to be reinstilled. He was, of course, very openly, a very um, openly believing and, and, and pious Christian. No less than Bob Dylan the folk singer from the 1960s. Remember, we looked at his song, The Times They Are A-Changin'. It was very emblematic of this new generation in the early 60s that was demanding all the social change. He turned in a more personal direction in his music in the 1970s and sort of got away from politics, explicitly um, expressed. But there's a song that you might look at called Idiot Wind. It came out in 1975. And it has a line that I think is very interesting. It says, it was gravity which pulled us down and destiny which broke us apart. You tamed the lion in my cage, but it just wasn't enough to change my heart. Now everything's a little upside down. As a matter of fact, the wheels have stopped. 
What's good is bad, what's bad is good. You'll find out when you reach the top, you're on the bottom. And I think it's, it says a lot about the time. Everything's a little upside down. As a matter of fact, the wheels have stopped. Um, things are topsy-turvy. The way they're supposed to work aren't working anymore. There's gridlock, there's chaos. Our old values, our old assumptions about the family, about men and women, and, um, you know, race and, and justice and patriotism were all, um, you know, thrown into uh, some turmoil from the, you know, cultural revolution of the 1960s. And even Dylan, who was very uh, identified with that cultural movement, is saying, I feel a little lost. This is an era when lots of couples are getting divorced because the divorce laws were changed to make it actually much easier to get out of a marriage. It was much harder prior to that. So a lot of people who were in unhappy marriages, uh, men and women, uh, got out. And so there's a sense that the whole society is in flux. And we don't know how to orient ourselves. What's good? What's bad? You'll find out when you reach the top, you're on the bottom. That's what American society figures out in the 70s, that in this post-war world of prosperity and you know global economic, political, and military power, um, it all kind of goes sideways. And we're left to figure out through our own moral judgment, our own uh, religious convictions, our own culture, our own political values, how to navigate that and deal with a much uh, more difficult new situation in the 70s and going to the 80s. There's a man named Ronald Reagan who comes along and defeats Jimmy Carter to be president, who is really speaking to this sense of a weak and diminished America and promising to make it um, great again, for lack of a better word. Uh, we're going to talk about that next time. All right. Have a good night.